awkward introducing myself after introducing everybody else this summer. Um, can folks online see my screen? Um, Joan, do you want to make me co-host so I can let people in? Thank you. And we have forgotten. Okay. Indy, so you're your co-host now? Yep, yeah, I can I can manage the online. Okay. Um folks online can see the screen, yeah? Yeah, we can. Okay. Let's get started. Well, welcome everybody to the final planned uh meeting of the quantum ethics reading group. It's been an incredible summer and I've really had the pleasure to interact with all of you uh, and hear many of your presentations and thoughts and ideas. And just so you're so we're clear, this is not the end of these meetings. This is just the end of the planned content. So next week, we're still going to meet. Uh, are we in Sky next week, Anna? Uh, Alice. We're back in Alice, Alice next yeah. week. Till end of August. And what I'm really excited about about the latter half of the summer is uh, that these are really going to be planning meetings. We want to hear from community members, folks at PI, folks from Waterloo, about what we want to do uh, with the quantum ethics working group that will be getting started in the fall. But this talk is going to be a little bit different than what we've seen so far. I'm actually going to be talking about the tradition and philosophy of social justice that I was trained in that is what brought me to found the quantum ethics project in the first place. So there's going to be very little quantum in here and a lot of social justice. I hope you're prepared. Uh, but I'm excited to get started. So first off, I just want to appreciate all of the fantastic lectures and videos that we saw over the summer. Can we ever have everybody give yourselves a round of applause for all of these? These were great. What I really love about what we've accomplished this summer is connecting quantum technology to a lot of important and pressing social issues, whether those be race or the ethical sourcing of uh, materials that we need to build the technology the relationship we have between technological systems and the poor. Uh, who is really going to benefit from quantum computing are all questions that we've explored in the past 10 weeks. And it reminds me of an excerpt from a book that I read this year, uh, Bernie Sanders' recent book, where he says that, in my mind, the fight that matters most will be over control of the technological progress that is transforming all of our lives. <laughs> and that we have to ensure that the technological revolution we are experiencing works for all and not just the 1%. <laughs> and I, I excuse my bad Bernie impression, I couldn't resist. But, but Bernie's right. The technological progress that we are making in this age is going to shape the outcome of all of the social issues that we've talked about. And talking about artificial intelligence and quantum computing in the social context I see as really central to many of the larger non-technological issues that we face. You know, I want to also ground this conversation because I'm going to talk about resources that talk about social change in some of the most adversarial environments. So Serbian revolutionaries deposing an authoritarian dictator in an environment without free speech, for example. But to ground those larger scale tools for larger scale change in what I see as the mission for my work in the quantum ethics project is transforming what we have here in Waterloo Region as quantum Silicon Valley into a global hub that discusses the issues inherent to quantum ethics. And we've made a lot of progress in that regard so far with the working group at the Perimeter Institute really serving as the first concrete investment by quantum Silicon Valley in these sorts of conversations. Perimeter is providing us with really essential support in cultivating this discipline and in leading the world in conversations about the social impact of quantum technology. So just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about my past, my journey uh, into fighting for social change, reminding uh, myself that I didn't always care about social issues. I wasn't always invested, and I think that's an important thing to remember. And then the majority of the presentation is going to be about how social change is made. We're going to see three kind of core references with other references named um, the, you know, that, that uh, revolutions in adversarial environments that I mentioned before in the hybrid movement model, how you build power in tech companies through unions, and finally, how you grow uh, a community and a movement through, you know, 
thinking about how we persuade others who may not immediately agree with us or how we might listen to others with differing perspectives and welcome them into, I hope, a diverse and broad-based community. And then finally, I'll leave us with uh, hope, which I feel is one of the most important kind of powers that we have. And that's kind of starts me off on my story. My story started where I was the least hopeful. When the pandemic hit and I couldn't go anywhere and I was just sitting at home scrolling my doom device, learning about all the catastrophes in the world, climate change, rising wealth and income inequality, issues that connect to my community back home. Transgender folks like me in the United States are currently uh, experiencing a huge wave of legislative attack. And it's unsafe for me to travel in some states in my home country, to be quite blunt. And folks who are experiencing racialized violence and racial issues, when George Floyd came around, it was a big wake up call, uh, I think for a lot of us. And it's you can broadly summarize a lot of these catastrophes in the immortal worlds of Bill Nye by saying the planet's on fucking fire. <laughs> it feels like there's too many catastrophes to deal with. And so that's where our story starts in hopelessness, wishing that we, I didn't have to live through a period in time where every word is followed by unprecedented and just feeling like, how could I alone do anything substantive to change any of it? How could I make any positive impact? So that's where my journey started. When I was a teenager, when I was 13 in 2008, in North Carolina, my parents lost their business in the, in the great housing recession that struck most of the world. And we became homeless for the majority of my teens. When things started getting better, we were in Arizona and I started school. This is where I lived, Winslow, Arizona. And this was a step up from what I'd been experiencing for the past five years. And when I was in university, BLM round one went through, went across the country, went across the world. You know, you saw people protesting for black lives in mass for the first time in a, in a new way in a long time. And I remember walking through downtown Flagstaff, Arizona, where people had drawn out, drawn out uh, mock chalk outlines to try and illustrate the human cost of police violence. And the point of bringing this example up is that I didn't care at the time. I didn't get involved at all. And this is important, and I'm going to reference this later on in the presentation, because we have to try and find ways to engage with and seek compassion for and welcome those of us, if you met yourself 10 years ago, would you agree with them? Would they see, would you see them as, as sufficiently enlightened? Maybe not, but that person is you. So how do we, how do we have a conversation around quantum ethics where the conversation often strikes upon these social issues where people might not be in the same place or mindset as, as others? So why didn't I get involved? Transparently, number one was white privilege. I didn't have a racialized existence or upbringing. My family was all white. We didn't have most many connections to the black community. Before I came out as trans, I also effectively experienced a lot of male privilege. And because I was experiencing such instability at home, my concerns were about dinner and gas money, not large scale social change. And that's an important thing to remember is when we're talking about changing the world, a lot of us are doing it from a place of stability, relative stability and recognizing that it's a privilege to try and make the world a better place. And so when some folks don't even have the resources, uh, barely have the resources to keep themselves going. And finally, and this is an important final piece that I'll circle back to in a minute, I wasn't connected to any communities that were passionate about social justice. And this will emerge later in the presentation as one of the key opportunities that we have as FEMFIS on Waterloo campus, the Perimeter Institute Working Group here at PI, by just building community and connecting folks to the conversations we're having, we're going to have a big impact. So the Great Recession maybe began, wasn't really there for BLM1, but I didn't start getting fully involved or start even thinking about getting involved in politics until the election of 2016. Afterwards, I volunteered for the person who would become the first bisexual member of the Senate, Kirsten Cinema. And cringy, I know, but that's me. <laughs> Campaigning in Flagstaff and knocking on doors, I voted for the first time in my first midterm election and committed to voting in every election and every midterm after that. You know, maybe it feels like it's not going to do much, but something. 
And then, as I mentioned, COVID had a big impact and we all lost our fundamental in-person communities. When the raids were happening on toilet paper in every grocery store in town, that was a huge time of uh, self-reflection for me, where I thought about, you know, what do I want my career to look like? What impact do I want to leave behind? And in academia, we are our, our main metric of productivity is publishing papers. So for me, it was about thinking, well, how do I make sure that the papers I publish actually matter and have a utility and a purpose beyond just increasing my H score or whatever it is? So the final point where I would say that I was fully I don't like the word, but radicalized was the US insurrection of 2021. That was my home. And I, for the first time, became concerned that my home, um, it wouldn't be around in the way that I had been raised inside of it. So after January 6th, I started reading. And um, I'd been doing some reading for fun up until that point. And up at this point, I read 22 books on average a year. I chart them. I've got an Excel spreadsheet. I love it. <laughs> I don't always read about <laughs> spreadsheets. I don't always read about social justice. Sometimes it's fiction. Sometimes it's, you know, random stuff that just keeps me interested. But a lot of the readings that we're going to discuss now, you know, are trying to answer the question of how do we make change? And the main point uh, is that alone, we can't do shit. Unless you were just born on the top of the pyramid with decision-making power, as some of us are. But for the most part, individuals on their own can't do anything. And I wanted to give us a little bit of a break from heavy content and just take a second to do a little science metaphor. We're going to motivate the basic concept we're going to talk about for the rest of the talk. Does anybody remember basic stat mech? At room temperature, how fast is an average air molecule going? Let's say most of them are nitrogen. So how fast is a nitrogen molecule moving at room temperature? Distribution, really? Okay. Meters per second. The median. Somebody throw out a guess, how fast? Average air molecule in this room, how fast is it going? I need a number. One. One meter per second. Others? Come on. 100 meter per second. What? 100 meter. 100 meters per second. Above or below that? What do people think? 50. All right, that's a good, that's a good starting point. <laughs> I've made you all squirm long enough. <laughs> so I did. we did this when I was an undergrad, but I had to look it up. I had to look up the relationship between kinetic energy and temperature. We all know kinetic energy, or many of us physicists do. And then you can just solve for velocity in terms of temperature. Insert all the constants. And anybody have a guess now? Anything different from what we have? Five hundred meters per second. Five times the top guess. So there's a lot of energy in this room. The metaphor here is that you are the particle. And 500 is a measure of your individual capacity for change. So there is a lot of energy in this room. For, for reference, the minimum wind speed of a Category 5 hurricane is 70. 70 meters per second, you have a category five hurricane. So each individual air molecule in here is 500. How could that be that we don't feel any wind? <laughs> not, not getting anything. What do we think? Does physicists in the, in the room know the answer to this? Isn't it because it's like randomly bouncing? They're not organized is why. Mm -hmm. they're, they're random. You feel, you feel this energy as air pressure. You actually feel quite a lot of air pressure because of how energetic these guys are. But the fundamental point is, if we want to make social change, we need to make our human system lower entropy. Physics jokes. So this is, this is my metaphor. If everybody had a completely different idea of how to change the world, and they didn't listen to each other, and they didn't work together, and they didn't coordinate, they didn't find some sort of consensus, we would get nothing done. So what happens if we all do it together? what a revolution looks like. <laughs> and the, meta, the thing I'm motivating is the concept of collection, collective action, which is a necessary condition for any revolution, any social change to take place. It may be necess a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. So now we need to think about how do you, once you have collective action, how do you make change out of that? 
So what methods are most effective at producing change? And this is the top three books that I would recommend for a reading. From the left, this is an uprising focuses, as I mentioned, on kind of those, those moments in history where you can have a group full of people with minimal power individually depose an authoritarian regime in Serbia or um, the civil rights movement in the 1960s or the Indian independence movement as led by Gandhi. And there's many other case examples that they cover in that book and how those movements were successful. From in the middle, A Collective Bargain by Jane McAlevey is a book about unions and how individuals within companies can form collective action organizations that can have power over the decisions that a company makes. And we're gonna look at a case example with Google to give a sense of how, where we're going with this in the tech industry. And then finally, none of these are, methods are going to be possible if your movement doesn't grow. If you end up just talking to the same people who all agree with you, you're not a movement, you're a clique. And we're not in high school anymore, cliques are done. So The Persuaders is honestly one of the best books I've read this year, maybe ever. Uh, and that's where they discuss a lot of really important ideas in how you not just convince somebody or change their mind, but how you listen to other people. That tends to be one of the emergent uh, features of a good movement. So this is an uprising, very, very um, loose sketch here. They talk about the distinction between two opposite ends of the change spectrum. You have mass protests, so think Black Lives Matter 2020, uh, or you know massive protests that we saw uh, in Serbia or uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement or others. These are spontaneous eruptions of social outrage with minimal organization overhead. They're very powerful, but they're very short lived and they often are not focused enough on specific ways to make change. So sometimes they can win huge overset, you know, up, uh, they can upend huge power structures, but not often. The second piece in their model is they talk about structured organizing. So think your nonprofits, think your organizations that are built to last for many, many years and do activity over a long period of time. They're very stable and they can implement effective strategies and map out a problem and really direct action in the right way, but they're very uh, heavy. They have a lot of inertia. It's hard to get a, a nonprofit to jump on an issue when it needs to be jumped on. And they wanna try and find a way to combine the strengths and weaknesses of these two models to build more flexible movements that can harness the power of mass protests when they arise, but still long enough to span the time between them. They call these hybrid movements. And the metaphor here, if you've got this explosion on the left and this mechanism in the middle, you can focus that energy into a blowtorch. Finally, they cover the methodology of a movement like the one in Serbia or like the civil rights movement. The, uh, the approach that has become most well studied as being the most effective at creating change, we call the civil resistance. And now I can explain what each of these are in more detail. So mass protests. What's an example of this? Well, I showed this picture of a tent before when I talked about my own experience with homelessness. But in 2010, when many folks were experiencing the worst of the economic recession, the Occupy Wall Street movement made pitching a tent in the city square or on Wall Street and not leaving until somebody did something about economic justice as their defining tactic. That's why they called it Occupy. Um, I, by the way, I have more on all of these but we don't have time in this block. So people ask me questions. I can tell you more about Occupy and what they were up to. Another piece which folks who are here in Waterloo in 2019 may have taken part in, I certainly did, was the Global Strike for the Climate organized by Greta Thunberg. It was each one of these uh, that I'm gonna show set the record for the largest global protest in history, each one. And they've all happened in less than my lifetime. So each of these three uh, explosions were very powerful, very widespread. Uh, but each had certain drawbacks due to the fact that it's almost impossible to coordinate 20 million people. So finding a way to make sure that all that energy goes into a productive direction uh, is one of the drawbacks of mass protests. And in addition, it, they're all very short lived. How long was George Floyd? Two months? Occupy a little longer? A strike for the climate? A couple of days? Like they poof and then they're gone. So that short lived version is also a, a weakness. With structured organizing, this was really popularized, at least in North America, by Saul Alinsky, who wrote the famous Rules for Radicals, 
which is probably one of the most famous books about changing the world uh, that I've ever heard of. It's like a core textbook. Um, and it still holds up today. There's quite a bit in there that's, that's still useful. Saul himself was a bit of a racist and, you know, from his time, not a great person, but the book is still useful. And in fact, the tradition of Alinskyite organizing was what Barack Obama did before he got into politics. He was a community organizer in Chicago, working for one of these organizations that are created to last for the long term. And some drawbacks for this is that these organizations tend to become very bureaucratic and sometimes tend to fight for the opposite of their issue. Because if you imagine an organization solving the issue it's built to work on, everybody who works for it is out of a job. So these organizations can sometimes even be found to push back against calls for, for change on the shorter term because they don't benefit from that. So that's a weakness of structured organizing. But as I mentioned, this is an uprising advocates for a combination of these and hybrid movements. And specifically, the reason that they want the structured organizing, one of the key reasons is to ensure that when mass protests uh, erupt, that they utilize the most effective tactics for generating change. And so that's where we'll shift now into discussing civil resistance. So civil resistance was first systematically studied in the academic literature by Eric Chenoweth and published in the famous book, Why Civil Resistance Works, where Chenoweth publishes some pretty shocking statistics, or at least surprising to most of the community, when she compared the effectiveness of violent uprisings versus nonviolent uprisings in a data set comprising 120 years of history across, across the world. And the core finding is that violent movements were found to be half as effective as nonviolent uprisings. I'll just let you sit with that for a minute. And she writes an entire book trying to explain why that is the case. She followed it up in 2021 with this gem Again, if you're trying to learn about civil resistance, I would highly recommend what everyone needs to know because this is post George Floyd. So they have incredibly pertinent and relevant data uh, that is incredibly relevant to anybody trying to make large scale change in the modern time. But what is civil resistance? The basic idea is that you wage a revolution that puts pressure on a regime and forces it to be deposed without hurting anybody. So you don't take up weapons, you don't even carry weapons. And if you want an example, think Gandhi, think Martin Luther King. But I don't like those comparisons because Gandhi was a pacifist. And many revolutionaries feel that pacifism isn't necessarily right for them. Or, you know, it's not, it's not asserting that civil resistance is the most effective tactic is not an endorsement of pacifism. I'm a pragmatist. And when it comes to civil resistance, and again, we can talk about this more in discussion period, but the basic fact is that violence is often and we're shown throughout the data and throughout the historical record as being counterproductive. When there is a sufficient uh, imbalance in power, a small group or a marginalized minority is trying to overthrow an oppressive regime, taking up weapons is fighting the enemy on their turf where they have the, where they have the upper hand and very rarely leads to effective uh, change. So let me just cover a couple quick myths about nonviolent action that, Cheno that are coming exact from uh, Chenoweth's book, What Everyone Needs to Know. Chenoweth br br brings these out very early on in the discussion. First is that nonviolent action is weak and passive. People think of nonviolent action as just asking nicely for the regime to stop being evil. That's not what it is. That so many people just assume that when you pick up a weapon, you're suddenly on a more reliable and quick path to liberation. And it's actually the opposite. In the historical record, violent revolutions become entrenched and take even longer than nonviolent ones to be successful. And Chenoweth covers that in her book as well. Finally, that nonviolent resistance is impossible or ineffective against extreme injustice. That's just false. And, and, and you know, many folks, when they think of the Indian liberation movement uh, that was you know, led by Gandhi, they think of, you know, the British occupying India as anything, if you think of them as anything other than a brutal regime, you're not, you're not uh, thinking true to the historical record. The British occupation of India was incredibly violent and incredibly brutal, and yet nonviolent resistance triumphed in that most adversarial context. And finally, 
that it only works against, quote, oppressors with a conscience, which I, I love that term. It's a bit of an oxymoron. But let's look at some data. We're math people. We like data. So this is from what everyone needs to know. Blue bars represent 296 nonviolent revolutions in the past 120 years. Red represents violent. So they are almost 50-50, a few more nonviolent revolutions. And that statistic that I mentioned, that uh, successful revolutions are almost twice uh, as many of these are nonviolent. That's coming from this plot. And you can see this. If you're going to win, you want to be blue. And if you plan on losing, you'll be red. How does Erica define success? This seems like a very nebulous. Idea. Yeah, this is an important point. Um, and she gets, she, Erica, like Chenoweth is a, I think like a Harvard researcher. So like a lot of her book is rigorous, like statistics and like she, she, she does her homework. Um, but roughly what we're talking about in terms of success and failure, the mission of a revolution in the, in the, the liter and the data that she studies are deposing the regime that is oppressing the group and issuing in a transition of power to a new government. But I encourage you with, with, you know, additional like specific questions about that. Like I can share you with the, the PDF and you can take a look at her more specific arguments for the, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move forward. But I do appreciate the questions. You can keep them coming. Okay. So when folk, when we talk about civil resistance, I'm being very vague, but we can broadly talk about the methods that a civil res, that a that a revolution is going to use and the pillars of power of a regime that they try to undermine. So when we think about methods, almost all of us, our first thought is a protest. And this is a photo that I took from the climate march in Waterloo in 2019 it was very ineffective. It was a fun one day event, but climate change is still here. So how did we miss the mark? Well, when this is another table from Chenoweth's book, and this is just a small snippet of all of the possible methods that a revolution has been, revolutions across the world have been known to use, and they are all organized into a database. So if you wanna see literally every possible tactic that you could take on, depend, they have to be right for the, mo the moment, they have to be right for the movement, and they have to be right for the opponent, but uh, picking a set of effective methods and varying between multiple methods are all features of effective revolutions. Pillars of support is that other ingredient, and I'm not going to read through these, but you think people, when people think of oppressive regimes, they think of them as having power of their own, power into themselves. They think of them as self-contained existing regimes. But the reality is that nobody has power without the consensus and agreement of core pillars. And so with regimes, that's security forces, economic elites, bureaucrats, media. And when we see in Chenoweth's two books, uh, when, when she covers the revolutions that have been most successful, it is because that they have built a broad enough base of support across enough distinct demographics of the population that you will see in Serbia, the military defecting and joining the protest or not firing on protesters because the officer knew that his son was among the crowd. And when you have the ability to undermine those pillars of support, that's when regimes uh, like these oppressive authoritarian groups, which you know you may not even have freedom of the press, nonviolent methods still can defeat them by undermining these pillars. So we also, I, I'm going to keep coming back to physics because we're just a, a group of scientists here. But Genoweth provides a formula for movement success, uh, which is momentum. She defines the notion of the momentum of a movement by defining the mass of the movement as the number of people engaging on a particular action on a given day. And velocity is the number of protest events in the prior week. And when they calculate this value for many of the revolutions in their data, they find that predicting whether or not a regime will fall on a given day, this is a pretty good predictor. And finally, they note that when they, in, in the entirety of their literature, there are not, there are no counterexamples to the statement that if a movement achieves mass participation of 10% of the population, no regimes have survived such a revolution. And in fact, the vast majority of them only needed about three and a half percent of the population to become regularly engaged and active. And again, questions about what is, how do you define that? What does it mean for someone to be regularly active and engaged? Uh, these are things that are covered in the book, but 
she posits that this is actually a nice metric for if you're trying to make change on a large scale, this momentum metric might be a good indicator of how well you're doing. They're easy things to count and you can plot that. And if your momentum is going up, that's good news. Okay, so I've talked in very kind of vague terms, but now I'm gonna give an example. And this is how I, uh, when I first read this is an uprising, it was because I was about to use some of these tactics. So I mentioned Kirsten Sinema, the first openly bisexual member of the Senate that I campaigned for in 2018. When she got into the Senate, she became one of only two people blocking LGBTQ civil rights from passing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but pause there to just let that, let that, yeah. So the first openly bisexual member of the Senate prevented LGBTQ civil rights from passing because she did not, we had, we had to have every Democrat vote to get rid of a, a rule called the filibuster. And I can talk about what that is, but to understand the basics of it is it's an, it's not even a rule in the Senate. It's just like a new, it's like a practice that's uh, metastasized inside of the Senate that is used by opposition to block basically anything you want to pass. So whether that be voting rights or LGBTQ issues, all of Kirsten Sinema's campaign promises uh, effectively went out the door. And I made all these when I was doing my activism work at that time. This but is I, the type of activism. Yeah, mimetic. There's a division of the CIA that's hypothesized to be a meme warfare department. Um, people don't have actual proof that it exists, but somebody proposed making it. That that's the in the, the official record. Yeah, it definitely exists. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the stuff you see on Instagram would fall under that category. So I came on as the lead LGBTQ organizer with a group called the Coalition to End the Filibuster, which was tasked with putting pressure on Kirsten Cinema. And I made this one too. I love this one. <laughs> putting pressure on Kirsten Cinema so that all of these uh, bills representing these issues could pass. LGBTQ so rights. So she did the filibuster? So we, she was one of the two Democrats that would not get rid of it. We needed all 50 to vote yes on getting rid of it. And her and one other person did not agree. And, and it's, so the filibuster was being employed to not have these bills passed? Correct. So she was indirectly preventing the bills from passing? Yeah. Basically like it's between the two-thirds majority of the argument is that once you got rid of it, you pass other bills with it. Not saying that, like, they make exceptions when it comes to things like tax cuts, but just saying that that was the. Yeah. Well, because well, first I thought you were saying she openly opposed the bills. Yeah, well, she directly protected the filibuster in context where it was made clear that um, that, that was preventing queer civil rights from, from passing. I thought maybe she had like other reasons to. What was her motive? <laughs> You'll have to ask her. I don't know. She's never really been one to give straight answers to much. Uh, but highlighting this issue and like the first, the very first thing that we tried was just asking her to change her mind. So my job was to try and understand how how uh, big a, a, a deal. Would it be to Kirsten Cinema if the queer community pulled our support of her in her next election? So here's a little thing. This is the election results from when she got elected in 2018. And if you do the math, her win margin is 55,000, 6,000. The queer population of Phoenix is twice that. So my basic calculus was, if we can make clear to her that the queer community really wants her to do everything she can to get LGBTQ rights passed. And by the way, when it comes to whether or not you're going to directly or indirectly block something, the bottom line is whether the trans community has health care. Because as I mentioned, it is not safe for me to travel through several states in the US now. And had she done her job, the laws that make it so that a doctor can refuse to treat me for being trans would be illegal. So directly or indirectly, that's the reality. She did it. She did it very knowingly. It's not that she doesn't understand the impact that her decision about the filibuster has. So what we wanted to do is create an escalating pressure campaign. First, we were gonna ask her nicely. And as a side benefit of creating this petition, we also get a sense of what do other queer folk in Arizona think? How does the community feel about this? And it's only after making that petition and having those conversations 
internally that we decided a petition would be a good idea. We would then use that petition to get media attention. If, you know, she said no, obviously. Uh, so at that point, you got to say, you know, there's got to be a stick after the carrot has been offered. And we finally escalated this up into an act of nonviolent direct action in front of her offices, where I was in charge of, of recruiting and organizing and helping train queer activists to get arrested in front of her offices to dramatize the issue and bring attention to it. And this is a feature of nonviolent direct action. Um, often when you're talking about, you know, how do you put pressure on somebody without harming anyone? When it comes to nonviolent direct action, you have to generate controversy. And so a key way to do that is to make sure that people are aware that the controversy that already exists, which is trans folks, health and basic rights being undermined, we make sure that people are aware that cinema is responsible for that continuum. So we signed this petition and we got 150 of uh, some of the leading community leaders in Arizona. So these are queer business owners. These are queer community leaders, uh, folks with a lot of uh, deep connection to the broader community signed onto this petition. And we were circulated throughout a number of different newsletters, uh, Salon, The Advocate, Them Magazine, LGBTQ Nation, Newsweek. And we were even, the sound isn't important. Uh, we were noticed by um, Rachel Maddow. So she in this clip is specifically talking about the fight for voting rights, which is another issue that cinema was blocking through the filibuster. And many of the people in the background on this video, the person with the rainbow shirt, a few other folks are folks that I specifically helped organize. And, and, and the key thing with nonviolent direct action is that you are training people to be, um, to be able to have the, to uphold the discipline to effectively carry it out without things going badly, without violence being conducted in a big uh, high emotion uh, moment like that, it's crucial to have effective discipline and training and organization to make sure that it goes well. And I, before, right when I ended that work and came to start the quantum ethics project, I left behind a group called the Equality Squad and they were featured in Rolling Stone in 2022 for their continued work fighting against statewide anti-LGBTQ laws in, in Arizona. So that is a picture of what they talk about in This is an Uprising. Using the structure of an organization to ensure that when mass protests erupt, that the protesters are focused towards ways that can actually bring about change and are trained in the discipline of nonviolent direct action to ensure that the movement has the greatest chances of surviving and, and winning. Now we're gonna switch over to unions. So this is actually very close to Waterloo's heart. Sarah's in this picture. Sarah was one of the first people who worked with me on quantum ethics and quantum ethics was really born out of the unionization drive for graduate students and uh, sessionals on Waterloo campus. We're the last major university in the, in the country not to have a graduate union. And so McAlevey provides a definition for a union, but very briefly, it's a collective effort by employees to prevent the boss from doing what you don't want him to do and making him do what you want him to do. So higher pay and no, you know, unethical practices. And, you know, we've talked about like big scale, you know, revolutions in the world and whatever, but this is fundamentally a, an ethics, a quantum ethics group. So I want to connect this to how do unions provide us a model for utilizing the nonviolent direct action that we've just talked about in the context of the tech industry? So keeping on with what unions are, this is an example of what unions can fight for. And notice, notice the number five. So if you want Google to do something ethical, one good way is to organize all of its employees and then utilize the power of a union and nonviolent direct action like a strike to force Google to be more ethical. And that's the story of Project Maven. So Google had a contract with the Pentagon to utilize its image recognition software to help them more efficiently process drone data. It was a very lucrative, lucrative contract. Google stand to lose a lot of money if they didn't renew it. But many senior Google software developers resigned because they did, felt that Google's motto of don't be evil was in fundamental contradiction with uh, using their technology to make the military more lethal. 
And after not only employees resigning, but petitions being circulated and a mass walkout, Google decided it would not renew the Pentagon contract. That is incredible power. A few years later, it's cozying back up to the Pentagon, <laughs> which is maybe a little bit less of a positive career trajectory. But this is why uh, Google employees are some of the first white collar workers in Silicon Valley to form a union because they believe that the union will provide them with the structure and long-term support that they need to continue fighting for the ethical behavior of your company. And the unionization process was in, accelerated by the firing of Timnit Jabru. So Dr. Jabru was a prominent AI ethicist who was fired by Google uh, for publishing a paper on the dangers of language processing models. So think chat GPT. Uh, she was raising flags about that years ago and they fired her for it. And it was a big story. A lot of news articles covered it. And I actually had the opportunity to meet Dr. Jabru. She came virtually to give a talk at a class I was auditing here last term. And I asked her what her theory of change was. How was she going to fight for AI ethics in the tech industry? And I thought her answer was really, really interesting. She said, one of my primary focuses is working to promote and support labor unions within tech companies. And that by building this sort of grassroots power that is able to challenge their employer's unethical activity, we can advance the ethical use of AI and machine learning. And her organization, the Distributed AI Research Institute, or DARE, is really interesting. They're very new, I think founded this year, perhaps, in the last six months, I think. And they do a lot, um, not just this, but they, they do a lot of really important work. And I see them as a bit of a model. Uh, for maybe what the quantum ethics project can do in quantum. So how did these employees uh, make Google change? Well, we're going to go back to those pillars of support and nonviolent methods that we talked about before. Now we're going to apply them to Google. What is Google's source of power? What makes them a powerful organization? I'm hearing something online, is somebody responding? Dog, a dog is just unmuted. But... Oh, okay. What's Google's source, source of power? Why are they powerful? Don't they get like government money? Money, yes. They're one of the most wealthy companies in the history of the world, or maybe the most wealthy company. What else? What makes them money? They also have like a really good public rap. Like everyone, I think um, Google has become the colloquial word for a search engine. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I feel like everyone is working. Their software is ubiquitous. It's powerful. Everybody uses it. It's the it's entered the vernacular. But where did their money and software come from? Oh, I'm um, sorry. A CMS is data, and then John also supports everyone using just Google as well. Um, yeah, that's good. And Sarah, ads that another source of money. Um, Katya says talented software engineers. Employees. That's where we're going. Perfect. Google's main pillar of support is the fact that their employees generate software that keeps their revenue streams healthy. So if we're gonna undermine that pillar of support, the Google employees started by organizing the employee body. They had internal conversations, which grew into a petition, which then grew into a walkout to demonstrate their solidarity. And this walkout is very similar to what a union would do, which is a strike. And effectively what all this boils down to is deciding to stop making the software that makes all the money. So the point here is that the employees hold a ton of power over Google if they choose to exercise their collective action using the sort of nonviolent direct means of walking off the job. You're on the clock, but you're not working. Had, uh, they, uh, had they like unionized before they did the walkout? No, they weren't a union yet. And they unionized afterward because they realized, you know, we won this one battle with Project Maven, but Google's going back to the Pentagon. We need long-term, better organizational support. And unions are legal entities with legal power over companies. Uh, so this is why. Go ahead, Sarah. I will just note that there's different laws in the United States protecting concerted uh, action in the workplace. Hmm. In the U.S., you can walk out without having a union. In Canada, it's not the case. Hmm. If you want to learn more about that? Yeah, Sarah is our resident expert on, on unions. She can, she can definitely clarify some of those points. Thank you for that. And Jane McAlevey says that the gold standard for organizing an effective strike that has real power over an employee is 
talking to the employees and organizing to the point where when you're ready to strike, you're striking with 90% of the workforce. The current Google union doesn't have the ability to do that. They're very small, they're early stages, but McAlevey talks at length about how, um, how this can be achieved and why it's important. So I'm gonna move forward a little bit, uh, just keeping my eye on the time. I wanted to try and leave time for discussion. We can obviously go over the hour, but for folks who have to leave, I wanna try and leave a little bit. Uh, but the point is that unions are forming across uh, North America and maybe even across the world. I've been paying most attention to the US and Canada, but unionization stories are becoming a lot more common. And when we think about like in the United States, in its history, the quote, golden age of its capitalism was 1950s. And that's when its unions were, the benefits from its unionization efforts after the New Deal uh, following the Great Depression were the strongest. And since the erosion of unions starting at, in the 1980s, we've seen a decline in you know, wages and ability to survive on a single income. Um, and now uh, unions are resurging. And so again, I think this is a, a viable model for us to think about the ways that we can collectively organize tech technologists, quantum technologists in particular, to exert influence uh, in ways that maybe we can't alone. I talked before about all of the crises that we're facing. I'm reminded of Pandora's box. And I'm also reminded about how many of those issues, climate change, wealth inequality, among others, are really driven by that corporate greed. Um, so if we can build power within a company, maybe that's a microcosm of what we would want to do globally. Maybe you start in your, your workplace and you win a living wage and you win healthcare and you win ethical behavior and non-discrimination in your workplace. And as you build power in each of your workplaces, this patchwork grows into one that can fight on the national or international scale. Also, uh, when a company unionizes, uh, over time, like it raises the wages of surrounding non-unionized employees in that industry by a uh, hundred percent. Wow. So one union in one sector raises its own wages because of collective action. And then for all the ones around. All the other businesses or employers in that sector, yeah. They have to become more competitive. Suddenly they have to compete with the unionized. Yeah, fantastic. And McAlevey has this, this thing to say about growing union support, which is our transition into the final portion of the talk, which is that if you're gonna win that 90% support, then you need to spend very little time engaging with people who already agree with you. This is what I was getting at before about clicks versus revolutions. And instead to bend most of your time to the harder work of helping people who do not agree come to understand uh, who is really to blame for the pain in their lives. And that's where we come to the persuaders. So uh, we've spent the summer largely talking among people who agree with us. Not everybody, but a large portion of us, especially those in FemFiz, are already geared to be receptive to arguments about social justice. So how do you start to think about a compassionate and effective way to grow support for these ideas beyond our social clique? I'm thinking about tech bros who object to Thank talking you. about race and gender in their math class, uh, or people who just think social science doesn't belong in conversations about quantum technology, or me in 2019, when I was of the opinion that quantum technology was neutral and I didn't need to think about how it was used. So when we're talking about working with tech bros, you're talking about talking to me four years ago. So. They first outline a helpful diagram, which is like, there are some folks like, let's say, as an example, I've got somebody who doesn't think transgender issues are important. That's obviously painful to think about because those issues are very close. To me. But rather than immediately labeling that person as a transphobe and moving on, that's not going to work. It's not productive. I want to think about how much of our values overlap. And so I can define a hierarchy of people for whom it'll be easier or more difficult to build a dialogue with and to listen to and to have a conversation. with. They talk about your 90 percenters, which are basically fellow activists who share most of your worldview, but just choose to work on separate issues. That's how they're not 100 percenters. 75 percenters, the example in the book was given a person who works on women's issues, women empowerment, abortion rights, may collaborate with Girl Scouts of America who cares about women empowerment but doesn't touch abortion. They're a 75 percenter. That's still someone with whom you can do a ton of amazing work. 
50 percenters are people with whom maybe they don't even share your worldview, but they share a lot of your common values. So an example might be my more conservative parents. Uh, so, you know, they might use the same kind of values to motivate going one way or the opposite direction. And so you, you have to think differently about the way that you engage with those folks and what a productive collaboration with your 50 percenters would look like. 25 percenters are folks who are working on the opposite issues to you. So really the only thing that you two have in common might be that you all think of yourselves as good people, but they don't share any of your worldview or really any of your values. Um, so they may be a lot more difficult to work with. And the number, you know, zero percenters, the book just labels them as fascists. I don't know if I need to go into that, but folks for whom there is no productive basis for collaboration. People who not only don't think transgender issues are important, but actively want to see me harmed. I can't work with those people. Everybody who isn't a 25 percenter though, I can work with. And the basic message that I've seen working pretty well in the IQC and in other places is that graduate students, postdocs, regardless of their political affiliation or whatever, if we're committed to a basic idea that our research shouldn't be used to harm anyone, that's a basis for working with everyone from the 25 percenters up. And they go into more detail. I wanted to include more about persuasion and the way that you craft your messaging and your wording. Anna Shankar Osorio is emerging as a, a really important leader in this space for progressives specifically. And they refer to her as the progressive Frank Luntz. Frank Luntz, I won't get into that. Some people are laughing, they know who he is. He's a conservative guy who pioneered a lot of effective marketing and messaging that won a lot of early, uh, victories for conservatives in the 90s and 2000s. And he published a book, Words That Work, which again, he's a 25 percenter for me, but I learned a lot from his book and I recommend it. Okay, the, when we're, so we've established who we can work with, but now we want to understand how do we go about taking someone who may be a 50 percenter or a 75 percenter and moving them closer to our side and working with them. And I'm not going, going to go into this entire story, but uh, this focuses on an activist, Linda Sarsour, who talked about her own experience with anti-Black racism. That when, at a, there was a time in her life when she did not see Black Americans as uh, when she had prejudices towards them. And she shares a story about how that prejudice was overcome in her early years because her father owned a store in a black neighborhood that she would go and spend time at and she would have the opportunity to make friendships and to play with the black children of the neighborhood. And that she saw other kids from her neighborhood who didn't have that opportunity, they kept those anti-black prejudices and sentiments as they became older, simply because they hadn't had the opportunity to form the relationships that would have um, eroded those views. So the, the quote to take away from this that she said that I thought was really incredible is that, for her, transformation comes from relationships. So we could imagine, what would it take to make this guy uh, less of a dick? And it was Bempis, actually. That fourth point about being disconnected from social justice spaces. By connecting to Bempis when I first got to Waterloo and having really meaningful relationships with folks who were 25 percenters for me, helped me from my own conservative upbringing, come to a place where uh, yeah, I'm here organizing this today. So again, when we think of folks who aren't in our camp now, um, there is a path to, to, um, to changing that. And the book ends, and I'll, I recognize that we're at time. Uh, we've had some questions, which were good, but weren't in my time budgeting. When we talk about like, how do you change someone's mind? Progressives do this very badly. We lead with facts and the figures and we try to educate people and it comes off as really pretentious and condescending and no one likes being condescended to. So don't try to educate. Don't try to debate, that's even worse. The fundamental thing you have to start with is that you have to respect that everyone arrives at the beliefs and conclusions that they hold for good reasons. We might disagree with that. We might say, you've got no reason to believe X, or you need to, you, you just have to re-examine it. You just have to read my, my sheet of facts to, to change your views. But the, fu the, the fundamental thing, the, the axiom that I come, that I motivate a lot of my activism from is that every single person believes what they believe because that was the best option for their life. 
they have good reason to believe what they believe because it was what they needed in order to get through whatever it is that that person lived through. And if you don't respect that person's fundamental, like, reasons for believing what they do, you don't have to respect, I don't have to respect someone who doesn't think I deserve rights. But I, if I'm going to connect to that person, people can tell if you don't respect them. And if there isn't a, an established relationship of trust, that you're not about to label them as something bad and that you can try and understand where they're coming from. You don't have to believe them or agree with them, but trying to understand what those reasons are and critically listening to what they have to say without judging them is a core, like they, they talk about deep canvassing, which is an entire method. And I didn't have, I don't have time to, to get into it, but those are core ways that people have found uh, in a systemic and well-studied context to help to change people's minds because you can't form that relationship that makes the change on a basis of judgment and on a basis of disrespect. No one's going to want to trust you to have a relationship with you to get to know you better if they feel that you think they're an idiot or they think that you feel that they're a bad person. So change doesn't come from facts or logic. It comes from their relationships. And if you want to get a sense of how effective the method of deep canvassing has been found to be, and again, this is coming from a couple of papers that have been published, when people go door to door and they do the method that is called deep canvassing and they follow a lot of these uh, core principles that I've outlined, they found that they've been able to move people's perspectives on a view 10% of the time. So gay rights, for example, that was a big one. When people didn't voted not to support a gay rights bill in California. Gay men went out and they wanted to understand why. And through this method of deep, deep canvassing, they were able to move the needle with 10% of people that they talked to. And that's an astounding number. And recall that when we're not just working in the global, trying to change an entire nation, but just a single workplace, Jane McAlevey says that 90% unity on an issue is entirely possible. So um, I'm gonna close with our greatest power for making change. We've talked about a lot of different tools. And if you don't have questions about these, I have concerns. I hope you have a lot of questions and that we get to talk about these and we get to talk about how much of this is actually useful for our context right now. But ultimately, I started this whole conversation about a time in my life when I was the least hopeful, when all of that bullshit felt like an insurmountable challenge. But if you know the story of Pandora's box, you'll know the last thing that comes out after all the bad. The, bot at the thing at the bottom of the box is hope. And I actually consider hope to be a mental illness. <laughs> you gotta be a little bit crazy to think that you can make change with tech bros and all these other different groups. But if we show up and we listen and we respect the other person and we try and build a relationship based on trust and mutual understanding, then their understanding of you will flow in the opposite direction as well. And there's a book about that. Oh, reading that now. Thank you. <laughs>